Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seats. The session will begin momentarily. Ladies and gentlemen, from Tableau, please welcome to the stage Constantine Greger and Sarah Battersby. Probably. Hello. Welcome to Map Hacking. Uh, my name's Sarah Battersby. I am on the Tableau research team former GI science professor, so I'm used to teaching uh, a lot of surly undergraduates. So I'll just let you know right now, I can see you texting under the table, um, just, just so you know. And this is my partner in hacking, Constantine. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Hello, everyone. As Sarah said, my name's Constantine. I'm working as a solution consultant out of our beautiful Tableau office in Frankfurt, Germany. Came all the way just for you guys. And uh, just like Trombone Shorty had two drum sets on stage yesterday, we thought it would be a good idea to have two speakers uh, on stage today. Okay, well, thanks, Constantine. Note, he said we're gonna have two speakers on the stage. I'm gonna kick him off the stage yeah. for a few minutes. Um, so I wanna start out just doing a little bit of level setting to make sure we're on the same page. I mean, this is an advanced level talk, but I wanted to make it clear that it is not a Jedi level session. Um, what we're gonna try and do is go through a number of things that we think are interesting and fun with respect to mapping and try and keep them at a level where you feel like you can go home and do the things that we've done and you can use them to take your mapping to a new level and try out some new fun tricks without feeling like, oh my gosh, there are like three people in the world that can do these things. So our goal is that everything we do are things that you can really take home, try at home. So don't think of any of these as completely inaccessible. They're really just fun ways to take your maps um, in new directions. When we were putting together the talk, uh, we started to think about what some good topics were to cover. And we came up with a number of goals that we thought were really important to us. Um, one was that we wanted to tackle problems that we hear a lot, either things that, that we've faced in our own work with Tableau or that we hear regularly from customers. I really need to be able to do X. I really want to be able to make my map do something. And so we wanted to use that type of problem and put them in good practical context to bring you some solutions that would, that would, that would be fun for you. Um, since Constantine and I are, um, you know, we're both you know, PhD holding, you know, cartographic license wielding, you know, geospatial people, uh, we really like to bend Tableau to our will. So we wanted to do some really fun things that would help you bend Tableau to your will. We wanted to keep them accessible. We wanted to do most of this in Tableau, but include some, some outside software because not everything can be done entirely in the Tableau ecosystem. But anything that we used outside of Tableau, we wanted to make sure that it was gonna be accessible to you. So we're big on free and open source or software that you would already just have lying around on your computer like Excel. So everything should be totally doable with what you have already. And we've tried to put together some reference material for most, if not all, of the demonstrations that we're gonna do. So we've got some blog posts, some Tableau public workbooks, and some GitHub repositories with some code that you can go ahead and just harvest. Give you a sense of some of the content that we're gonna cover. This is not in presentation order. We'll really go through these in sort of a least hacky to most hacky sort of order. Um, but the types of content that we wanna cover, um, one is taking advantage of some of the new functionality in Tableau. So we'll talk about uh, really easy methods for creating great circle routes using KML files, which is something that became possible in 2018 too. 
distance calculations using R and or set actions, and the set actions will be in 2018-3. Alternative map types, because sometimes what we offer in Tableau isn't all of the maps that you need. We'll talk about some fun with map projections, which is always near and dear to my heart, so if any of you have map projection questions after this, I am happy to totally geek out on that. And then augmenting flow maps in a number of different ways, so adding directional arrows, as well as doing some animation and following great circle routes. So if you're gonna take your camera out and take a picture of one thing, uh, here's our resource slide. It's got links to a number of the blog posts that we've written, and those are gonna have a lot more step-by-step -step instructions than what we're gonna be providing today, because we've got 55 minutes and 50 seconds left, so we're gonna go through things a little bit quickly but the blog posts are gonna have a lot more step-by-step -step instruction with materials that you can download, so you'll have everything that you can take away with you. And then I also have uh, my GitHub repository posted up there. Uh, there's a Tableau folder, which is really just random things I do at work that I think are kinda cool and fun. And I write some code and I throw it into GitHub thinking maybe someone will be able to use this at some point in time. And I'll point out that I am not a developer. I'm a research scientist. I write some probably pretty ugly code, so please don't mock me. I'm also used to writing for undergraduates, so there's a lot of commenting, probably more than most of you would want, but you know, it's better to have it than not have it. And I don't necessarily do things in the most efficient way, because I wanna make sure that it's really clear what's happening step by step. So feel free to modify them and actually turn them into good code, and then maybe send them back to me and I'll, I'll update. So I'm gonna start out with some demos on mapping flows and great circle routes. And what you saw, um, that little title slide, when you download the slides from this talk, and I hear that they're all gonna be available probably next week, um, we've gone through, we've screen captured a lot of what we're gonna be doing today. So you can go back and look at the screen captures and have some notes attached to those as well. So the first thing I wanna start out with is a question that I get pretty frequently, which is, I wanna be able to show how a couple things are connected. I wanna show the path. But the straight line isn't always the right, the right way to do it. So typically, you know, if you were gonna show a path, you might start with some points, start adding some kind of unique identifier, get like a weird squiggle, try and remember how to like straighten that out and get it to be actual lines. So I'm gonna drop my origin destination onto the line mark type for path and I end up with all of these straight line connections. So what these are, these are all of the flights for one day from Seattle. So this is great if all you really wanna know is how do, I, how do I connect A and B? There's no real direction involved in this. I just need to know what is, what is connected to what. But when you're talking about spatial data, that doesn't necessarily tell you how you got to that location. So I hear a lot, I really want great circle routes. I don't want straight lines. So instead of those straight lines, I wanna be able to see, you know, where would, the act, where would the airplane actually fly on its way between Seattle and any of these other locations? So back in the day, in order to get those great circle arcs, there are a lot of really interesting and really complex blog posts and questions on the forums that you can look at that'll document how to take an origin location, a destination location, throw your data into R, throw your data into Python, use all tricks, bloat up your data set, take your really nice two verte vertex origin and destination and turn it into like 20,000 vertices to define all of those paths. And then you would use the lines in Tableau and connect all of them. But that kind of bloats up your data pretty huge. In Tableau 10.4, we made what I thought was a pretty cool, huge advancement where we started to support line string geometries. So you could calculate all, all of those individual vertices, but you didn't have to have them as separate rows in your table. You could just create a line string and bring them straight into Tableau as a geography. So that was a really great, huge new improvement. But we've got something even easier and better now. So starting in Tableau 28, 2018.2, we made a change to how we render lines and polygon edges. And we're gonna treat any of those lines or polygon edges for file types like KML files as great circle roots. So what that means is you can take a two coordinate line string, 
And this is an example of a KML file just showing one line string with two vertices. One of them is for New Orleans. One of them is for Berlin, where TC Europe will be next year. And that's all I need to draw a great circle root. A little bit smaller than turning that into like 100 different vertices to connect together to make a line. If I were to add that KML file into Tableau 2018.1, this is the line that I would get. In 2018.2 and later, I can take the geometry that was created, drop that onto my viz, and it's automatically gonna give me the great circle root. So now all you need to create great circles is two vertices for any line. Which I think is pretty cool. And of course, here's the map hacking trick that you need for it. Um, I do all of this in Excel. There are a lot of different ways to do this, um, and I'll actually show you where you can get both an Excel workflow and a Tableau prep workflow. But I have my data set that has all of the flights out of Seattle for one day. I've got a column for flight number, the latitude and longitude for the destination, the latitude and longitude for the origin, which is exactly the same in every column. And I have a segment name. And this image down on the bottom is just showing you I'm writing a big concatenate string in Excel. That is the hardest part of this process. And it's kind of a gnarly concatenate string. I will admit I wrote it in Word in like a text processor and then pasted it into Excel and that was the way that worked easiest for me. You can just download the Excel workbook and copy it from there. No need to actually write it out yourself and spend the two minutes trying to debug it. Save that as a KML, so you're just gonna get one column with all of your data with all of these place marks in it. I copy it, I paste it into my text editor, I put a little KML header at the top, I put a little KML closing line down at the bottom, and I bring that file into Tableau. What I get in Tableau, I have a data source, it's got my description, it's got my name, and then it's got this column of line string. And that line string is really just two vertices. So for every one of my roots, all I need are two points, which means that this file is really small, especially when you compare that the other method was write out, you know, 100 vertices per line and blow up your data set. So now all I do, I drop my geometry on the viz, and I have great circle arcs for every one of my paths. Now I just want to show you something really quickly, because I think this is sort of cool. If you scroll up to the top of the map, you notice how you get this straight line up at the top? Every once in a while someone asks me about that. In case you ever care, Web Mercator will cut off all of your data at about 85 degrees north and south. So if you have data that goes above that latitude or below um, negative 85 south or negative 85, um, it'll just go along a line at the top of the map. Just something to know. If you want some more information about that, uh, so Constantine and I actually wrote a blog post with a bunch of files that you can download, um, Flights of the World, How to Map Great Circle Routes and the newest re release of Tableau. And we go through everything from downloading a really cool data set from the Open Flights database, processing that, how to make your great circle routes in Excel, and how to make your great circle routes using a Tableau prep workflow. So if this is something that you're going to be doing repeatedly, you can just create your single prep workflow and rerun it every time your data set gets updated and generate a new KML file that you can drop straight into Tableau. One additional thing I wanna show you, um, just because this is kinda cool, um, so this is from one of Alan Walker's blog posts, and this is where you actually do want to calculate every, vertices, every vertex along your great circle arc. So this is uh, his version of recreating war games with Tableau and Mapbox, in case you guys remember like the 1980s movie of war games. Um, I highly recommend this blog post and it's a really cool image. So I wanted to show you how you could make an animation like this. So I have actually run a Python script which you can grab from my GitHub repository. I've taken my origin and destination locations for uh, my flights from Seattle. I've converted them all to a bunch of vertices that run along the great circle routes, dropped them into Tableau, and while I was writing out my data, I created this segment time from midnight dimension. And what that will let me do is when I drop that on the pages shelf, see if I can get this to run correctly, rewind it. I should be able to rewind it. 
I knew that something weird was going to happen during this presentation, and that would be it, hopefully. And so by writing out, uh, I used a Python script to calculate each of the individual vertices. I'm grouping to them together into little 15-minute chunks. I'll speed this up so the planes will fly a little bit faster. But in theory, what this is showing you is for any time of day, where should all of the flights leaving Seattle be approximately in the air? So I have a script that you can grab for this, and you can just watch all of the flights traveling along that flight path. So if you do want to do something, for instance, animating your flights along a great circle route, you will have to calculate out all of those vertices. I just think it's sort of fun. So if you're going to hack your maps, you might as well have fun with it. The next thing I wanted to dig into um, was looking at some alternative map types. So one of the questions that, uh, that a Zen master brought to me uh, sometime earlier this year was, you know, it's great to be able to have the built-in maps in Tableau, but what I really want is something like a dot density map. And so I was like, you know, that, that might be kind of fun to make, but it sounds sort of hard. So I thought about it for a while, and I came up with some ideas and, and figured it out, and I think it's really a pretty cool trick. So I wanted to show you guys how to create some dot density maps in Tableau. And I also wanted to explain why you might want to do this and what this map type is. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a map of U.S. population. So looking at the U.S. population by county, this doesn't give us a really good idea of the spatial distribution. We see that there are a few counties that have really high populations, for instance, Los Angeles County down here, um, and then we have a lot of counties that don't have particularly high populations. But it doesn't really tell us about the true distribution of people. And the reason that that's important is when we're looking at things at the county level, and this is one of my favorite counties in the United States, this is San Bernardino County. If anybody's from San Bernardino, yay! Um, one of my stomping grounds as a kid, also the largest county in the world, um, which is not really that impressive because Alaska doesn't use counties as a designation, and I don't think any other country uses counties as a designation. But I will say that San Bernardino is really a large county. It involves a lot of empty desert space. It's also a county that has a fairly, fairly large population, about 2 million people in San Bernardino County as of the 2010 census. Now, if you look at a county-level map for the whole U.S., all you see is one value for that county. But if you break it down at a finer level, since, say, by census tract, you see that the population is actually really all down in this one corner, and maybe a bit right in here. So by showing the population at that county scale, you're not really getting a sense of where the people are. You're just getting the single value. And just in case you thought, well, you know, why don't we show everything at the tract level? Um, because one, it's a gigantic file, about 600 megabyte shape file, uh, 72,000 and change, tiny, tiny little polygons, and it looks really horrible. So here it is with borders on. Here it is without the borders, and you really can't see anything that's, that's really telling you anything about a pattern. So I wanted to make a dot density map that shows us something about the true spatial distribution of the population and how it changes smoothly and continuously across space. So I've created this in Tableau, and I can alter it to see more people per dot, fewer people per dot, or what I think is pretty much just right. So this is a different way of looking at the distribution that tells us something a little bit different about how the population changes across space and is a little bit more analytically valuable than using a choropleth map. So in order to do something like this, uh, just a little about the data source, I grab cartographic boundary files from the US Census because you need some polygons for this. You need some attributes as well, so I grab some attributes from the American Community Survey. And what's going on under the hood is I've put all of this data into a Postgres database because we can bring in data from Postgres um, and read it into Tableau. I can't bring in the geometries natively, but I can bring in all of the XY coordinates, and I can use all of the spatial processing in Postgres. So I bring in the data into Postgres, and I just run a little custom SQL from Tableau that says, for every census tract or every county, whatever my geographic unit is, figure out how many points I want per polygon, randomly assign that many points inside each polygon, and then dump that out as a table of X and Y coordinates that I can bring into Tableau and use for my visualization. Basic SQL query. I can give you the workbook for this so you don't have to read that tiny, tiny little text. And it gives us that really nice dot density map. 
The thing that's nice about running this from Postgres is that I often don't know what I want for my number of how many people per dot or how many pigs per dot or cows per dot or whatever the value is gonna be. So I can use a parameter in Tableau and then change it dynamically. So it's kind of like playing, you know, like you're, you're doing one of those um, you know, Goldilocks kind of things. You know, this one's just a little too much, a little too little, and this one's just right. And then you can combine with changing the size of the point marks, maybe that's a little too big, changing the color or changing the opacity. So at full opacity, you get this kind of bright map. But as you tone it down, you start to get this softening of the edges, which makes for a really nice visualization. When you're working with smaller geographic areas, um, for instance, this is South Carolina, um, instead of using census tract level, because it's so much smaller geography, I can actually use census block level data, and it gives me a nice visualization of how the population's distributed around the state. And I can also use the same trick of having a parameter so that I can adjust how many points are drawn on the map. And I can adjust it until I get a pattern that I feel like is really good and reflective of the true distribution of the data in this location. So the resource that you can grab for this, I wrote a blog post on dot density maps in Tableau using Postgres. You can download the data sets here, or at least have a link to them, and it'll walk you through all of the steps for getting the data into Postgres and doing all of the processing so that you can use this type of visualization to show your smooth and continuous distributions in Tableau. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Constantine for a couple different things. Yep, thank you, Sarah, that was great. I definitely need to, re need to re watch War Games, that's for sure. Um, so what I brought you today is what I think is probably one of the most useful visits you'll have seen, you'll have seen all week. Although, admit it that it's the last day and the last session of conference, it might be a bit outdated, but still, nevertheless, maybe a few of you will stay in New Orleans for tonight. So this is a viz that shows you, well, let's say all the point of interest that might be of interest to you for a night in New Orleans. And it has everything covered for you. So you might want to start with the tourist information to get some, some information on where to go. Obviously, you need some cash, so the ATMs, all the bars where you can lose that money. Then maybe go to a theater, watch a show, or to a nightclub if you're into that. Um, and then, depending on how the night might end up, um, you might need a police office or not. Now, the thing that I want to talk about here is actually distance calculation, because this is something that you can't just easily do out of the box in Tableau. So in the past, we were actually required to use external services for this. And in that case, I actually use R to do that. So let's just have a brief look at some R code. Why not? And this is basically the code we need to do that distance calculation. As you can see, it's kind of gnarly. There's lots of calculations going on, con conversions between degree and radiant and so on. We're calculating the geodesic distance and then we are basically iterating over all the points and in the end building up this kind of text that tells me the n closest features to whichever feature I'm interested in. And as a result, if I now mouse over some of those, I can see that the three closest bars to the bottom line, for example, are Siberia, Melvins and Always Lounge. In case you're interested. Obviously, it's very interactive, so if three is not enough, you can also set it to five. The code will rerun, produce a new um, tooltip, and now you have the five closest ones. And also, for those of you in the audience who are not from the US, you also have the option to change the distance measure to a more meaningful uh, unit, like kilometers, and that tells you how far you have to walk um, from one location to the other. So that's all nice and fun and we can use R and it's actually very fluid and it works nicely and we can manage those things. But wouldn't it be nice if we can do those things directly from within R, uh, directly from within Tableau? And luckily, as Sarah said, in 2018.3, our awesome dev team has brought us a new feature called set actions. And those set actions actually allow us to do something really cool, like in this map, for example. So it's actually the other way around. So I do select a location, maybe Siberia, I click it and it shows me all the locations within a certain search radius. You can see in the top right corner, you can set how far do I actually want to walk. Again, kilometers or miles, wherever you come from. And this will show you all the locations within the search radius and even tell you how far it is. Or for the ones that are too far, it will also tell you that, uh, that this is too far away. Now let me briefly show you how we built this. So set actions, obviously sets are involved. So we're gonna start with one set down here. And as you can see in this set, there is just one of 199 values selected. This is the one that I just clicked on. As a second step, we're using a number of LOD calculations. I'm just gonna show you the one actually for the location. 
um, a number of LOD calculations to find out which of those are the selected ones so that we know the latitude, longitude, the ID, and the name of the selected feature because we need those. We can then use a very simple calculation to, dis to calculate the distance between every feature and the selected one, and then we have a little evaluation, is this distance between my feature and the selected one within the search radius that the user selected in the parameter? And as a result, we can then fill a set based on the condition if the within distance that I just calculated equals to one, which means it is within the distance, then it should be part of that set, otherwise it shouldn't. But you might be asking two things. A, where are the set actions? And B, how the hell did he get those, uh, the one feature into this very first set, the one that I clicked on? And this is exactly the magic. So let's have a look. Let's have a look at work, worksheet actions. And here's my select an ID. And for those of you who are already using the beta, you know that there is also this new set action option down here, change set values. So this allows me to actually define if somebody does select anything in my map view, for example, I can select features in a certain target set, right? And this is exactly how we did this trick of selecting a feature on the map and the calculations being run. So as you can see, this is very useful. You've already seen a few other examples of set actions in the keynote, but I believe this is a, actually a very useful one because it tells me which bar is in walking distance or ATM. Now as Sarah, or actually I mentioned in the beginning, um, I'm from Germany, so that's quite a long distance, and I do love obviously having a party, but I also do like planes. So I wanted to work a little bit more on the topic that Sarah already introduced, the whole flights mapping topic. And um, yes, those animations were great, but that's not always feasible. Sometimes you just wanna show direction in a more, well, let's say subtle, subtle way. So let's have a look at how we can do those things. First of all, a little uh, introduction, maybe how to draw those lines in the first place. So let's assume, and this is actually the format that most people get their data in, we have a table of points. In this case, there's four points, A, B, C, and D, with their coordinates. And we do have a table of connections, which tells me that, for example, connection one goes from A to B, and connection two goes from C to D. It's a very simple data set, just keeping it simple. Now, the easiest way to draw those lines is actually to use those connections, but not only once, but twice. So we are doing something we call a self-join. And the fun thing that happens is the Tableau automatically introduces this field table name, which tells me which instance of the CSV file does each of those rows come from. And if I then try to join the points in, I'm using another uh, cool feature that we introduced, which is I wanna join with the point ID from the points table, but from the connections table, I wanna join based on a certain condition, so I can use a join calculation or calculated join. And the condition here is very simple. If the rightmost character of my table name, that's this field that Tableau created for me, if the rightmost of those equals the text one, then it should actually be the end, so then I want to join it with the two, uh, the, with the coordinates of the two point, otherwise else I want to join it with the from coordinate, end. All right, so I can use this one, and as we can see down here, it worked beautifully, because now both of those connections will join either with point one or point B, so I get both coordinates in separate lines. And this then helps me to actually draw my lines. So if I drag out the X coordinate, set this one to the average, and the Y coordinate, and I draw the connection ID, the last thing I'm missing is which direction or which order should the points be connected in, because obviously we wanna draw a line. So I need something called the path ID. I'm just gonna create a calculated field, and since I'm lazy, or actually since I'm German, I'm efficient, I just copied in that stuff in here so I can replace this one. In case the last character in this field is a one, then I want to use a number two, otherwise it should be a one. Okay, and I wanna make this one a dimension so it works, and I can put this one on the path shelf as well, and here's my lines. So that's beautiful. Little wrap up, we basically used this self-join of the connections file, joined it using a join calculation with the points, and that gave us our, our fields. Because Tableau figured out which way to join those two coordinates together, and that way, should it be point A or point B, and then we can draw the lines. But the thing is, those lines don't show me direction. For example, the blue line, does it go from the bottom left to top right or the other way around? Now, a few things you can, you can do here is, for example, use path ID and put it on size. That gives me kind of a direction, but this would, for example, make me believe that it goes from top to bottom, which, spoiler alert, it doesn't. Um, I could also put it on color, 
which also gives an indication that there's something different, but I still don't know which is the beginning and which is the end. So wouldn't it be nice if we were able to draw arrows directly in Tableau? And yes, of course, that's possible. It is a bit tricky, though, and that's, again, why we're doing map hacking, right? So earlier we saw that I used the self-join of a table with the connections to create actually two lines of data out of one, to draw one line. Now, as you can see here, an arrow basically consists of three lines. So all I'm doing is I'm actually multiplying six times so that we can actually draw two lines. The first one will be this orange line. That's my main line. It goes from point A to point B. That's easy. The other two lines, they end at point B, but we don't know where they're starting. So this is going to be the hard part. But before this, we're actually going to use not a double self-join, but a six-fold self-join. I know this looks weird, but it's actually pretty straightforward. You can do those very easily. So we have six instances of my condition, of my connections file. We're using this a bit more in contrived formula for the join calculation, but that's actually very easy using the modulo trick, so we can split it up. And there we go. So now my coordinates will be assigned accordingly. As I said, the first line goes from A to B. The second and third line end at B, but we don't know where they start. And lastly, we also use the segment ID, which basically tells me which of those uh, coordinates belong to which segment of my arrow. The orange one is the main line. The blue and the red are the other ones. So this is what it looks like. Now, the difficult part, as I said, is how do we draw those two lines for the arrowhead? And this is where we need a little trigonometry. And uh, yeah, this is like back in school. There's two things we need to consider. First is the slope of the main line. This is the orange line. In this case, I used 45 degrees because it's simple. And the second one is how far does my arrowhead open? OK, and we basically, we just add those two angles up and use some trigonometry to get to the x, y coordinates of the two squares. And you can see the calculations down here. They're a bit gnarly, but they're actually not that hard to understand. You can also see a parameter called scaling factor in here. This will help me later on to def dynamically define the size of my arrowheads. And this is what it looks like. So here's my little arrowhead playground. I'm going to show you what I mean. So the scaling factor, currently it's set to 2. If I set it to 4, you can see how my arrows actually got bigger. Or if I want to change the angle of the arrowhead, let's maybe set it to 45 degrees. You can see it looks ugly, but it's an arrowhead. Let's maybe set it to 10, so I get a very narrow arrow. Okay, so this actually helps me so that I can use the data or use parameters to drive what my arrows look like. And once I've done that, I'm actually exactly where I want it to be with my simple arrows. Now, using this on a simple data set like that was very easy and very fast and also very easy to understand. But wouldn't it be great, since we're a map hacking session, if we can use those on a map as well? And yes, of course we can. Otherwise, it wouldn't be an example here. So I'm using the same open flights data set that Sarah used earlier. And here we go, all the flights out of Frankfurt, mapped beautifully so you can see directly where they go. When I saw this for the first time, I was really, really pumped and I thought, this is the best for about 15 seconds because then my view went up here to Northern Europe. And if you look at the arrow, for example, that goes to Iceland or generally the ones that are in Northern Europe, they don't really look right. They don't look the same. As Germans, we need to have them all clean and look the same. So I was wondering what is going on. And the answer is very obvious. It's the map projection that Tableau uses. The web mercator, dreaded web mercator, strikes again. Now, the good thing is that I knew that Sarah and Alan had already written blog posts about how to work around this problem when they worked on their hex density binning, uh, hex, bin, hex binning, sorry, um, where they actually exactly triggered or tick tackled this problem and fixed it. So I could basically go back, steal their code, and make my directed arrows really nice. And here they are in all their beauty. They look really beautiful. They all look the same. And I can even select a different airport, for example. Let's see. Probably most of you are going home today, so let's have a look where you can go from uh, New Orleans. And this is all the flight connections. This is all where the parameters come in handy because those arrows are way too big. So let's set them maybe a bit smaller. And here's your map. So there you go. Directed arrows in Tableau. Everything is data-driven. Nothing is hard-coded. Everything is completely dynamic. I think it's pretty beautiful. So with that said, and since we already mentioned the topic of map projections, what else could I do than invite the, the master, the maps overlord of map projections back onto stage to tell you more about it and also how you can, well, work around the dreaded web mercator in Tableau? Sarah. Thanks, Constantine. So I'll start out by saying that um, I, I actually kind of like the web mercator. And it may just be because it gives me a lot of jokes to tell and a lot of fun things that I can claim are, I'm doing research. I'm thinking about Web Mercator. And people are just like, oh, yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh, 
But I know that Web Mercator isn't for everybody. So I want to show you some ways that you can get around that limitation in Tableau. The first thing is just to, just to demonstrate what happens in Tableau. I'll switch over to the presentation view here so it's a little bit bigger. So if you drop in any of our geocoding polygons or you bring in any of your own spatial files, we're automatically going to convert it into the Web Mercator coordinate system. And we're going to plot the data in Web Mercator. So if you know anything about the projection, you know that as you go farther away from the equator, you're going to see increases in the scaling factor. So things are going to get larger and larger. Alaska is big, but it's really not that big. Uh, but that's what you're going to see in Web Mercator. But sometimes what you really want is something that looks a little bit different and maybe has locations in slightly different places. Um, so here's an example of something uh, that I put together in Tableau to be able to look at all of the US counties. And this is showing water use per capita in case you were curious about the attribute. And it's using a Lambert conformal conic projection. It's got Alaska and Hawaii that have been shifted to their true location off of the California coast. You know, if you're familiar with a lot of mapping, you know that that's really where they belong. Um, and it's got little inset boxes around them, which I think just distinguishes a little bit that they're actually drawn at a different scale and that they don't really belong in that location. Um, I'll also just uh, point out, this is something that was really interesting to me about map projections that I learned when I was an undergraduate, and it may have been total professor lying to me, but I had heard that Alaska at one point passed a resolution that they be drawn at proper scale and in proper location on all maps. I don't think they were successful in enforcing that with anybody perhaps other than people mapping Alaska, but I thought that is so cool. You can also uh, render this just without um, without the inset boxes as well. Same data set, just in red, because it was pretty. So how would you do this sort of thing? Um, well, the main thing is just understanding what the magic is behind map projections. And the basic thing you need to understand is, what is Web Mercator? Web Mercator, sure, it's a map projection, but it's really just treating your data as if it belongs on this really gigantic Cartesian coordinate system that runs from negative 20 million to positive 20 million. So, so long as you can get your geographic coordinates into any value between negative 20 million and positive 20 million, you can lie to Tableau and have it drop your data onto the map. Now, note that the key point here is you can lie to Tableau, and I am totally giving you the right to lie about data. Now, most of the time I would not say the pathway to a good visualization is to take some great data and lie about it. But when you're talking about map projections, it really is a good pathway to get exactly the look and the feel and the design that's going to be right for your data. Because oftentimes you want to be able to eliminate the projection distortion that you get with Web Mercator. So how would we go about lying with our data to make it so that we can use any map projection we want and drop it into our Web Mercator base map? The thing you need to know is that Tableau is going to take any data set that you give us. We're going to figure out what the map projection is based on, if you're using a shape file, there's this thing, it's a PRJ file that defines the map projection. That's this little tiny set of text here in black and it's linked to our projection file. We're gonna read that, say, ah, I know what projection this is. I'm going to reproject it into Web Mercator and then I'm going to display it in Tableau. So what you need to do is you need to make Tableau think that your data is Web Mercator but really use whatever projection you want. And it opens a lot of great doors because all we're gonna do behind the scenes is look at what is the actual coordinate for every vertex in your data set and then we're gonna drop it in the right place assuming that it really is Web Mercator. So the way that I do this, I have to go outside of Tableau and I use a tool called QGIS, um, QGIS. It's a free and open source GIS package. Makes it really easy to do this transformation. So I bring in, in this example, I bring in my census county level data. It tells me that the data comes in with uh, the uh, coordinate system 4269, which I think is uh, probably the North American datum of 1983. And I resave that file with a new projection. So I reproject it to the Lambert conformal conic projection. And then I'm going to do a little trickery. This is where, you know, I start to feel a little bit shady for about 30 seconds and then I, you know, forget about it. First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to start moving geography. So I just start editing the file. I select the states that I want. I drag them where I want them. I want Alaska off the California coast. I just pick it up and move it. It's a great power. 
And then I use the affine transformation tool to rescale it until it's the size that I want, because Alaska at true scale is a little bit too large uh, to have my map look good. Now I'll point out, um, I have not found this tool in version three of QGIS, so I actually keep both versions two and three installed on my laptop, and uh, I just use the affine transformation in two to do my scaling of geography. Once I've got all my geography in the right place and I've got my projection defined correctly, I'm gonna go back in and find that PRJ file in my file explorer. I'm gonna open it up in a text editor and I am going to delete everything that is in it because that's what's gonna tell Tableau that it's in Lambert conformal conic and then Tableau is gonna try and put it back into Web Mercator and that's not what I want. So I just delete what it says and I replace it with what I want Tableau to think. And I want it to think that the data is in Web Mercator. So I go to the web page, the epsg.io web page. I search for Web Mercator, which is 3857, if you ever wanna just search for it by number and make everybody think you're super smart. Um, or you can just type in Web Mercator and it will also find all of this information. And they are gonna have a number of different ways of defining the projection information. If you go to the Esri WKT, so Esri well-known text, there will be a long text string that will define what this projection is, and that's what Tableau wants to see. So just grab that chunk of text, drop it into the projection file for your reprojected data, and when Tableau reads in this shape file, it will think that it is looking at Web Mercator data, because it doesn't know any better. We just see that projection file, we say Web Mercator, and off we go. So once we know, you know we've got that projection redefined, all Tableau is gonna do is look at how do I drop it into a coordinate system that runs from negative 20 million to positive 20 million? Okay, I'll drop it there, sounds good. And you get something that looks kinda like this. So it turns out that's not actually where the United States goes, um, but it's also really useful because if I want this particular projection, so long as I have enough data, enough context in my spatial file so that I don't need to use our base map tiles, I can go ahead, drop this data into the Web Mercator coordinate system, and then all I have to do, let me just jump back out of projector view, all I have to do is open up the map layers and wash out the base map. And then I've got the data set that I want with the look that I want. Now know that you're gonna to wanna to lock down a few things. You know, one, probably don't let people change the map layers because they're gonna figure out that you're lying pretty quickly and then they're gonna be a little bit like, hey, what, where, why is this data so bad and weird? Um, you might also not want to let people use the geo search function. It turns out that it's gonna take you to the location, say, on the Web Mercator projection. So if we're looking for maybe New Orleans, it will zoom us to, if it's gonna zoom us there, hey, there's New Orleans. Turns out it's not in our projected data set, because remember our data has now been shifted over to roughly the equator, uh, or roughly zero, zero. So just know if you use this trick, um, you, might, you might need to lock down some things so that people can't access GeoSearch. If you want more details on this, um, so I went ahead and I've, I've written a lot about map projections. So they're kind of like one of the things that I like to, to geek out on primarily. So I've written up a four part series on map projections, starting from map projection basics, which describes you know, just some of the elements of what are map projections, what are the basics that you might wanna know in order to manipulate them most effectively, all the way through moving geographies, changing map projections, and one of my personal favorites, working with polar data. Um, any of you guys work with, with data in like super high latitudes or polar data, and you feel like you know, Web Mercator just is not gonna be quite right for that? I'm just assuming that everybody is totally nodding their heads right now. They're like, you know, I have always wanted to make a really cool map of uh, Antarctica. So you can totally do this. Um, you can use this trick in Tableau and map things like polar sea ice. And all I did is I, I shifted the geography. So I'll just show you. We've got our data in its proper location right off the African coast. 
But in order to get a really nice base map around this, I used all of the same tricks that I use in Tableau, and I made a custom map box tile set. So I went into map box, I deleted all of the basic data that they provided. I dropped in a continent data set, which was just these gray continents in, the, um, in a polar projection with a nice black background. I grabbed some satellite imagery from the National Snow and Ice Data Center. I think it's Snow and Ice Data Center, something like that. They do a lot of polar data. I brought that into Mapbox, so I have a little bit of imagery in the middle right around Antarctica. And then I took all of this polar sea ice data and dropped it on top in Tableau. And then I can use the Tableau analytical tools and start doing things like animating how the polar sea ice changes seasonally over time. So this is a data set that runs from the 1970s up into the 2000s, and you can watch the sea ice ebbing and flowing throughout the year, and it's kind of cool. But it's not something that you can do out of the box in Tableau. So I was super excited earlier this year when a makeover Monday was all about polar sea ice data. And I'm hoping that there's some more polar sea ice um, mapping that comes up next year uh, so I can get more people using this trick. Because I didn't see, I saw almost no maps in that makeover Monday. And I think it was because people think that mapping polar data is kind of hard in Tableau. You just remember, lie, lie, lie. One more fun trick, and I'll just jump back, um, just in case this ever comes in handy for you. Uh, this was a question that somebody brought up to me in the forums. Now, let me see if I can find the image. So this was, this was really cool. We've got this little tiny image, and I'll explain what it is. Maybe I can make that larger. Um, so the question was, I have a map image that I need to work with. I don't have base map tiles for it. I don't have, I can't use any of these projection tricks to put it in the background of my map. Um, I have a high resolution image that has all of the context data I need, and I need to get that in Tableau, but I need to put my data on top of it. So here's the problem. It's not latitude and longitude, it's a projected coordinate system. How can I do this without manually placing every point on the map and labeling it? Because that would suck. I think the data set um, that, the, that, this, that this was based on, this question in the forums, was probably a couple thousand points. And I made an example with, I think these might be state capitals or something, just because I needed some data to use. So I was thinking, how, how would you go about doing this? And it turns out you can use some really fun tricks in QGIS to do this. And I've documented it all on the forums. But the basic idea is I took the image, and it was a good high resolution image. I brought it into my GIS and I rectified it. So I, I registered the image so that the coordinates were in, you know, the, the image was scaled appropriately for the map projection. I brought in my latitude and longitude data. QGIS is smart enough to be able to drop that in the right place by converting the latitude and longitude coordinates into the new coordinate system that I've, I've rectified this image into because I knew that this was, I think this is an Albers equal area conic. I then created a new X column and a new Y column with the projected coordinates for each one of my latitude and longitude values. So then when I bring the image back into Tableau as a map image, all I do is I register the four corners of the bounding box of that image and then use my projected coordinates that I calculated in QGIS and I can drop any projected data on top of this now. It's a really fun trick in case you have background imagery that you need to use, this custom imagery. And then I just have one more super cool thing that I want to show you. And this is something that was one of those things where I totally wish that I had done this, but I did not. And so I have to give like a thousand percent awesome, super awesome credit to our partners at Datablick and, um, and Star Schema. And they've been working with the extensions API and they have created this really killer tool to be able to use any of the map projections available in D3 to pair that up with your dashboard visualizations for interactive use. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at what they've done. So we're gonna configure their extension. And it needs to know, you know, what data set am I gonna latch onto? So we've got some data that's in the dashboard. And this extension is going to hook into 
some data on our scatter plot. And I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna put our country on the geographic name. It's gonna be, we're gonna use that for labeling. Our country code for the geographic dimension, which is gonna use for geocoding. And then I'm gonna pick an interesting attribute to drop onto the map. Uh, maybe, I don't know, we'll take birth rate or something. We'll fill that by. I can customize the marks that show up on the map. I'm just gonna take the defaults for now. And then this is the really cool part. I can customize the map projection that's gonna show up. So this is not gonna use the geocoding polygons in Tableau, but it's gonna use geocoding polygons that are built in and gonna be rendered using D3. So I can use any one of this set of map projections that are supported by D3. So I'm gonna start out just with the equal earth projection because it's pretty cool. And I'm gonna go ahead and make the graticule just a little bit more noticeable because it's gonna be handy when we wanna take a look at this. And so now I have a map that complements the visualization, complements the scatter plot, but that's in a map projection that is maybe more interesting or more appropriate for our data set. It's gonna be linked with the other visualizations. So if I pick a country, it's gonna then highlight in the scatter plot. If I highlight a set of data points, it's gonna highlight in the map. So this is allowing us to use any map projection that D3 supports and pair it up with anything else in our dashboards. But wait, it gets better. This is, this is where I think like, mine's, like my mind just gets totally blown. So you can enable a projection rotation. So it's not that I get this map projection that's just like hanging out and sitting there. It's like fully interactive. This is where I expect like the ooh. So if you are doing your polar mapping, just center it on a pole. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the rotation. We'll go ahead and zoom in. And of course you have full zooming capability. I can still go and select any of the polygons and it's going to interactively, dynamically play with everything else that's on my dashboard. I think this is, I mean, this is just the coolest extension for me. I know they talked about this at the Extending Tableau front and back talk, which was, I think on, I think it may have been yesterday, so you'll have to go and get the, the recording of that or get the slides when they're available, but it's absolutely worth taking a look at because this is just amazing work that they've done. And I wanna show you one other projection, uh, just because we can. I've gotta get back out of the projector view for this. or maybe I won't, there we go. So if I go back in to reconfigure, I can change the map projection. And I'm gonna use an orthographic projection. So the orthographic projection is, essentially that's the make it look like a globe projection. And we'll reset the projection view. And now when I enable projection rotation, I essentially have a spinning globe that I can use to explore all of my data. So the moral of the story with these particular examples, if you need something kind of quick and dirty, go ahead and reproject your data, cheat, lie about what it looks like, lie about where it is in the world, change the map projection, lie about what the map projection is, bring it into Tableau, and you've got your custom projection to work with. If you need something high-end and interactive, the work that's being done by folks at Datablick and Star Schema, and I think that this is gonna be made available to folks, uh, it's really amazing for doing truly interactive map projection enabled visualization. So I'd highly recommend taking a look at what they're doing uh, because I think this is really a game changer with being able to use the extensions API to take visualizations to a whole new level. And with that, just want to make sure that you guys have all of the references that you might possibly want. So we do have resources on all of these um, examples that are available to you. There is a session survey that you can complete. And if you want to get in touch with Constantine or me, here's our email addresses, our Twitter handles, and all of the contact information you might want. 
Um, Constantine and I will be up here answering quest any questions if you'd like to talk with us. We're happy to, to talk with you about your hacking projects or any potential ideas you have. Um, we knew that we had a finite amount of time in this session, so we wanted to just hit a handful of different topics. But this is, this is really kind of what gets us up in the morning and gets us, gets us to work, is thinking about ways that we can bend Tableau to our will. So if you've got great questions about, and problems that you've been working on, we'd love to talk with you about them. So thank you. Thank you.